Hey guys, so the Goblet of Fire movie has its critics. I mean, it really has its critics, with many fans calling it the worst Harry Potter movie of the eight. It left so much out from the books. Mike Newell clearly didn't have the passion nor the enthusiasm for the story, admitting that he didn't even read the book. However, what it does have is something spectacular, and that's Voldemort's rebirth. That scene for me was completely incredible. Everything seemed to fit. The gloom of the graveyard, Cedric Diggory's death, and even Ray Fiennes' debut of the character in full form was nothing short of brilliant. And something that really stood out for me was the on-screen rudimentary body that we all know from the books. And from what I've read, a lot of time went into finding the right design. Anyway, the point I'm making is that it's one of the few times where the movie actually gets it right. And it's actually the rudimentary body that I want to discuss today. So I'm going to go into detail and talk about what exactly went into creating Voldemort's rudimentary body. From the spell, to the substance, to certain rumours and speculations surrounding the body's actual fabrication. So let's not wait any longer and continue the video. So let's just briefly run over the situation here. Voldemort becomes disembodied after trying to kill Harry as the killing curse rebounded on himself. Everyone had thought he had been defeated or killed or even just gone missing. Nobody really knew what happened. The truth of the matter is that Voldemort was left in a ghost-like spirit kind of state. He didn't even know what he was and there's a great reference to it after his rebirth to full power where he says as follows. What I was, even I do not know. I, who have gone further than anybody along the path that leads to immortality. You know my goal, to conquer death. And now, I was tested, and it appeared that one or more of my experiments had worked, for I had not been killed, though the curse should have done it. Now what puzzles me is the length of time he spent in this misty spirit-like form, which really doesn't make any sense to me. By the time he actually created the potion and new body, it had been well over a decade. So why wait so long? Did he always know how to do it? I mean he had Quirinus Quirrell for starters, I know he latched onto the back of his head and was living off him so to speak, but could he really not have suggested the rudimentary body back then? It's like he had a list of plots to try to return to power and went through them one by one, with the rudimentary body finally working. I actually can't really put my finger on why he waited so long. I don't think he trusted anyone enough to take care of him in such a feeble form. Can you imagine Lucius Malfoy carrying that small creature around in his arms? Because I certainly can't. Why would he put himself through so many years in such an unbearable state of existence when he had the knowledge all along to return his body to full power. He didn't need Harry Potter for starters. He wanted Harry's blood because he believed its properties would be beneficial, but the line was, blood of the enemy forcibly taken. Voldemort had enemies everywhere he looked, unless of course he never considered anyone his true enemy because he never believed anyone but Harry Potter was a threat to him. In addition to that, don't forget, the Dark Lord was about to give up on ever returning to power and getting his body back. He was very close to accepting his fate as a result of creating Horcruxes. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? Voldemort just accepting defeat and giving up. It was only through Wormtail seeking him out did he finally decide to give it one last try at regaining everything he had lost. Realistically, the rudimentary body was most likely written into the story with the hope that many might not take into account that it was close to 13 years before he actually did it. Or it could be the case that Voldemort only came across the magical knowledge required to create the body and the rebirth spell itself. This was seriously advanced magic and something that would not be uncovered lightly. Even in his weakest form, Voldemort was still able to use magic to his advantage, which in a way, highlights just how powerful he truly was. Now that does bring up the question, 
How did he create the rudimentary body? And furthermore, how did he create that rebirth spell? So let's take a look at the body first. Now Voldemort is a misty, smoky, ghostly… look he's just not solid. That's the point I'm trying to make. The trick is getting him from that state into a solid form. What does the body then consist of? They can't just conjure living tissue from nowhere and make a living person. Now I don't really feel all too comfortable with what I'm about to say next guys but it genuinely feels like it's the only way they could have done it and that's use a child's body as a host for the Dark Lords to take over. Perhaps 3 years, maybe 4 years old, maybe even 5 years of age. Let's just take a brief look at how the body is described in the book. It was as though Wormtail had flipped over a stone and revealed something ugly, slimy and blind. But worse, a hundred times worse. The thing Wormtail had been carrying had the shape of a crouched human child. Except that Harry had never seen anything less like a child. It was hairless and scaly looking. A dark, raw, reddish black. Its arms and legs were thin and feeble. And its face, no child alive ever had a face like that, was flat and snake-like, with gleaming red eyes. The thing seemed almost helpless. Because a child's brain is so far from its full development potential, the Dark Lord had no trouble overtaking it, just as he did Quirinus Quirrell, except there's no body sharing this time. This body has become his own. With that thought in mind, and you know something, even if it isn't the case, I think regardless of how he created the body, it still was not his original one he had before his downfall. So anyway, going by the assumption that this body wasn't originally his, which means there's no way he can possibly survive without some sort of additional help, he had to drink unicorn blood so it could sustain him. Just like with Quirrell and himself, which is why it's no surprise that unicorn blood is once again in the picture as one of the key ingredients to the preservation potion. The blood has been described as keeping someone alive even if they are within an inch from death and it's mixed with Nagini's venom. This is what also puzzles me. Nagini's venom is one of the most potent venoms in existence. It has the ability to keep its puncture wounds open and even melt stitches. So now you're telling me that this venom, when mixed with unicorn blood, is going to give Voldemort the strength to actually hold up his wand and use it. So how does that even work? Well, it's because Nagini's venom can be deadly or beneficial. You're probably wondering what I'm talking about right now. Well stick with me because I'm going to explain. If you've watched my previous video on why Voldemort turned Nagini into a horcrux, then you'll know that what I'm about to tell you is similar to what I'm telling you now because the information is important to this video too. So Nagini's race or snake type was never disclosed in the books. She was just described as having a large triangle shaped head. Anyway, the key to Nagini's venom is in her name and its background. In Hindu and Buddhist tradition, Nagas are a race of semi-divine snakes with great powers and a female Naga is called a Nagini. Although we have never been told what kind of snake Nagini is, Nagas are traditionally depicted as large cobra-like snakes. Nagas have an affinity for water, carry the elixir of life and symbolise both fertility and immortality. In Malaysian tradition, the natural enemy of the Naga is a phoenix and I just want to add that I love that the natural enemy is the phoenix, that was cool but let's look at the sentence that tells us that the Naga can carry the elixir of life and also symbolise immortality. Now it's quite often the case that anything mythological in Harry Potter stems from real life mythology, so if that's the case then I think Nagini's family in the Fantastic Beasts movie will have something to do with the Nagas regardless of the race of the actor who betrays her. Hindu and Buddhism exist in every corner of the world. So it makes sense after separating the two substances to understand just how effective they are when combined. Voldemort even had enough strength to lift his wand, use the killing curse and even create a horcrux so it must have been a pretty effective potion but as we all know 
only lasted several hours before he had to feed again. The fact he was able to even create a horcrux does support the theory that it was at least a human body he possessed. So guys, with that being said, that is my video on how Voldemort created his rudimentary body. I know there's a lot to it, so if you want to ask anything further, let me know. Do so in the comment section below. I'll do my best to answer the first couple of questions I see. Thanks again, guys. Have a great day, and I'll see you all in the next video. Thank you so much for watching. I truly, truly appreciate your support. Everyone, notifications of uploads are more important than ever. So please, if you haven't already, turn those notifications on to make sure you're notified the moment my video goes live. Making videos is what I love to do. It's my dream and my passion. However, it does cost time and money to produce this content. So if you have a dollar to spare to support me on Patreon in exchange for some exclusive unseen content, then you can click the Patreon link below or at the end of this video. Please only support me if you can afford it. And make sure to follow me on Instagram at InstaDNJ and on Twitter at Potter Folklore. Check out my other videos appearing on screen and please make sure, most importantly, to hit that subscribe button. Thanks again everyone and please have a great day.